Greetings friends, my name is John Edward Lamuth, and I will be presenting today my doctorate dissertation proposal through the American University of Sovereign Nations. And my dissertation is entitled Behavioral Solutions for Advancing Global Peace and Harmony. And I feel that this, uh, this title sums it all up because I, I will be going along with uh, describing how behavioral psychology can serve as a foundation for a master system of ethics and values <clears throat> that, that will greatly help uh, promote global peace and harmony, being that knowledge is power and so the more people that are in tune with their feelings and emotions and what is happening, I feel that they would be better able to channel these into a positive construct where everyone in society gets along as opposed to a lot of the selfish kind of, kinds of behavior that are going on. So here's my abstract here. and. Uh, I bring up the point that there's a lot of uh, moral relativism that's being uh, promoted in the secular world and that's because uh, people are afraid of uh, showing any kind of religious favoritism uh, due to, you know, the, uh, the scriptures mention a lot of the virtues and values, you know, in their sacred texts and but what I'm going to show is that uh, you can uh, show, have a behavioral foundation for the virtues and values that are good for the seculars, secular population, as well as the religious. And I show, I, I talk about how they, they could be new inroads into religious tolerance and. Uh, <clears throat> This is especially crucial uh, in, in the public schools where uh, a lot of students aren't getting a good moral uh, character education. So uh, this, uh, this also applies to the um, well, um, I should just read the, uh, the abstract here for everyone and then insert my comments here. Our modern secular age has primarily favored the trend towards moral relativism as opposed to more absolutism underpinning organized religion. Ideally, a behavioral foundation linking these two perspectives should prove exceedingly beneficial invoking instinctual principles shared in common by all of humanity as well as the rest of the animal kingdom. When expanded to include the higher order class of human cultural values, like the cardinal virtues, the theological virtues, the humanistic ideals, etc., the affiliated traditional groupings of virtues and values rightfully enter the picture. Here a radically new model of motivated behavior is currently proposed, one that melds modern behavioral psychology with the long-standing traditions underlying value ethics, a trend encompassing the hierarchy of personal, group, universal, humanitarian, and transcendental realms of inquiry. This is the crucial linchpin about on my whole system is based, uh, <clears throat> where the synthesis permits a grand unified theory of ethically motivated behavior, organized as an ascending 10 level hierarchy of the major groupings of virtues and values. The reason it's 10 level is because uh, it's comprised of both authority and follower roles, which uh, I will explain further on in the, uh, in the text here. 
<clears throat> in terms of this overarching behavioral foundation, the moral commonalities across all re religious traditions are emphasized, encouraging new inroads into religious tolerance, as we see in the flashpoints across the globe. This can further serve as a secular, serve a secular constituency where such moral issues have typ typically been downplayed due to well-meaning attempts to avoid religious favoritism. So here we can bring in the virtues and values without offending any religion or even offending the, the secular crowd that has no such leanings. This self-Satan system serves as a valuable adjunct to the major religions without favoring any one of them, encouraging the potential for peaceful coexistence, particularly being that it does not preclude the existence of a top-down pattern of a supernatural nature as well. As I will further show, there's a whole class, at the highest level, there's a whole class of the mystical values that apply equally well across the uh, religious spectrum. Consequently, this grand unified synthesis, it potentially amounts to the best of all possible worlds, something we're not really in now, whereby encouraging an ethical revival within the secular world, as well as the potential for even a greater degree of spiritual cooperation and tolerance amongst all the established religions of the world. So that's, uh, that's basically the whole outline of uh, what I'm going to be proving here. This, uh, I, I divided my uh, dissertation into diff, uh, chapters. The first chapter uh, one is uh, we talked about the goal problem in the uh, abstract there. But uh, here I outline the master groupings of virtues and values and how, how they're divided into authority and follower roles and, uh, how, and uh, the behavioral psychology that fig figures in on the uh, per personal level and then advances to a meta-perspective hierarchy into the motivational matrix. And then uh, I, I talk about the the global ethical applications for this part. And then in chapter two, I get down to more of the details here. Here I, br I bring in uh, B.F. Skinner and the principles of operant conditioning, uh, procurement behaviors and anticipation of reinforcement. And then I show how uh, there's a background uh, conditioning a natural setting where uh, different animal societies operate in the same way and then in a social setting for humans uh, we have an introspective terminology for the conditioning theory here are the uh, this is the personal level here we're talking about and uh, which uh, go into more detail on and they and then also there's the uh, accessory motivational terms where the the you and I perspectives are reversed, allowing uh, insights into empathy. And that's um, a very hot topic of research nowadays is uh, uh, feeling the empathic and uh, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And, and then uh, I sum it up here with a review of conditioning theory here. And then also the uh, schematic, the schematic definitions, where rather than just uh, relying on intuition, I spell out in longhand uh, the exact placement within the linguistic matrix of the virtues and the values, along with the personal authority, personal follower, group authority, etc. And this is uh, so precise; it's. It can even be programmed into a computer for like ethical, a artificial intelligence. 
So uh, moving on to chapter three, I start. Uh, we we are built on uh, personal foundations in chapter three. I mean chapter two, and now uh, we send to the group group realm of the uh, ethical hierarchy, and this includes the uh, cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude, and the uh, what I call the personal ideals, glory, honor, dignity, integrity. And then uh, skipping ahead to chapter 4, we get into the spiritual or what we call uh, the universal domain and that uh, that is distinguished because it represents the group of all groups first we were in a, in a group level and then uh, then we send in a meta perspectival fashion to this what I uh, all religions take on a what they call a spiritual perspective but uh, you can look at a universal realm also, like the United Nations, it's re representing all of humanity. So it, this uh, could be controversial, but uh, for a secularist, but uh, like I said, all of these virtues and values here have secular connotations, like uh, Providence, liberty, civility, austerity. This is what I call the uh, civil liberties, because we have civility and liberty right in them. And then we have the theological virtues that are mentioned in Scripture, but they also have uh, deep secular uh, meanings, faith, hope, charity, and decency. You can have a faith in a person or an ideal in society, you can hope for a brighter tomorrow. There, there, there's no reason to uh, leave these out for people that are uh, really looking for a character education, you know. And so, uh, going on to chapter 5, we have the humanitarian uh, innovation, and that is universal authority over all ages and times. The, uh, like I said, the spiritual is more immediately focused where we're looking at the uh, timeless themes coming up here. So you see grace, free will, magnanimity, equanimity. Those have more of a uh, historical time-based flavor, similar with the classical Greek values here. Beauty, truth, goodness, and wisdom. You would think that that is the highest level you could go. I mean, uh, but in the next chapter six, we reach the transcendental perspective, and that is a perspective where you, that builds on all those that went before, and um, it transcends them and contains all of them as subsets. And here we get into the highest ones. The humanistic values, I call them. Peace, love, tranquility, equality. And then the transcendental follower uh, tradition here, which I call the mystical values. Ecstasy, bliss, joy, and harmony. And then beyond that, there's even like a supernatural realm. There should be no upper limit to this hierarchy. This is just the this is just the highest nameable range here. I mean, uh, there's uh, so many speculations, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of religious people that are going to have a lot of opinions on this. So uh, in chapter seven, I, I I mentioned a little bit earlier about the accessory virtues and values, where the uh, all of these are. Uh, there, there's there's synonyms of the major terms, but uh, uh, they still have a distinguishing ability in that uh, the you and I is reversed. So if I'm talking to you about a certain emotion, then you can put your yourself into my place through uh, these kind of terms here. And like I said, write them down and 
can you, this also applies to artificial intelligence. So uh, moving ahead in the uh, presentation, uh, this is still part of the accessory, all these accessory terms. I, I gave them all a separate section. But here we, uh, we talk about here the counter maneuver of the other, where uh, we, we, I look at communication in general as between myself and who I think uh, you are to me, and then you have your impressions of me from my outward actions. So it, it's a, uh, you actually have to read it uh, to really get the finer points on that. But chapter eight now, we're, we're moving into the general unifying virtuous themes. So each grouping of virtues and values has its own master theme that uh, over that gives a general flavor of the whole thing. So uh, you have uh, the sequence of uh, individualism, personalism, romanticism, ecumenism, humanism. That's the sequence for the authority role. And then the uh, for the follower, you have something more uh, future-based, pragmatism, ecclesi utilitarianism, ecclesiasticism, eclecticism, mysticism. And you can also make schematic definitions out of these themes, and they're they're, they're very uh, very uh, makes sense a lot on that and. Uh, this, these, these, all these themes are the basis for what we call a, a perennial philosophy, where you borrow the best uh, from all these different, these are all different uh, traditions. So uh, I make a point that this is perhaps the most comprehensive perennial philosophy that's been devised until today. And. Uh, I give all the backgrounds for these and show how they really do fit in to this pattern that I'm proposing. So uh, moving on to chapter 9, I have some accessory uh, versions here where, uh, where we're talking about communication as a, a person to person with both people present. There's also uh, what we call the phantom dialogue, dialogue where the where one person is communicating with somebody that's not there, like in letter writing or uh, you know, other kinds of di long distance communication, where I fill in your roles and then when you read it you, you see what I was thinking about them. That's where the empathy enters in. So we have uh, for the phantom, for the authority roles we have the pledge, the proclamation, the edict, and the testament. We, uh, there's no themes for the transcendental because they're, they're so abstract anyway. And then for the follower, you have the, the grant, the charter, the sanction, and the chronicle. And then the, for the fantasy dialogue, this is uh, pure fiction, the realm of pure fiction, where <coughs> both parties are, are uh, abstractions. And here we have the... the for the authority roles, we have the fable, the legend, the parable, and the allegory. And, and for the follower roles, we have rhetoric, propaganda, prophecy, utopianism. You know, uh, according to the descriptions, uh, we, we can see how these even add an additional layer of validation above the themes, above the individual groupings of virtues. So this is like a three-part, three-level system that, that just ha ha hangs together perfectly and it seems very unlikely that, that this uh, just an artifact of uh, coincidence here. So move, uh, the last, uh, next to last chapter is chapter 10 where I go into the, uh, the real global applications here and the uh, talk about the different ethical systems, the golden rule, the silver rule, there's a bronze rule, it's kind of a hybrid, and, and then there's the uh, iron rule, which is uh, which is what 
a lot of uncooperative people do. The iron rule is do unto others before they do unto you, which nobody wants to be on the end of that deal. So, and we look at uh, society as a positive sum game where we all need to work together to keep the, all the benefits and the privileges we have of this global international conglomeration of people working together. And then finally, chapter 11 here, I go into uh, my very most broadest uh, conclusions, uh, how this whole system can work for global cooperation and harmony. As you probably saw before, peace and harmony are are two sides of the coin on the uh, transcendental authority and the follower roles. So just the fact that all this is, a lot of times uh, we just look at the individual virtues and values, we don't see their, when, if you can see their connection to all of the others, then this is just a major step forward and towards understanding and Hopefully, uh, then we have the, I have the bibliography and the acknowledgments. And, uh, so here, here's a list of the tables here. A lot of these are the definitions I talked about. We'll, we'll see those uh, coming up. And um, we'll see the, the listings of the, the groupings of the virtues and values. And here are the list of the figures here. We're gonna, right away, we're going to see the major virtues and values and ideals. And then... And then so uh, here we are on, on the first chapter, the introduction, the global problem. Uh, I'm kind of I briefly mentioned this, some of this uh, I talked about it in the abstract also. But uh, like I said, if we could show a, uh, a behavioral foundation for the, for the secular as well as the religious realm, and that includes everybody. Everybody has something that they they can uh, get on board with. And uh, like I said, once you see we all share the same virtues and values, then then the scriptural details and the exclusionary stuff that doesn't necessarily apply that much anymore. So let's go down, let's scroll down a little bit to the uh, maybe the first diagram here. Okay, here, yeah, here's the master hierarchy of the uh, uh, individual terms. Uh, this, uh, they, they, these are divided into authority and follower roles. On the left side of the, uh, of the bullet point here are the authority roles. And, and you can see the increasing abstraction going, going from top to bottom. Glory, providence, grace, tranquility. And then on the right side of the bullet point are, are the uh, follower roles. Because they follow the authority. That, that's why I call it the thought follower roles. Because these are roles that are, are uh, expected in a future directed time frame. Because, like I said, um, conditioning is a two stage process. You have you have the work that you put in for uh, the pro what I call the procurement phase, where you're anticipating reinforcement, and then the, uh, that the only one role can be active at any given time because it's a sequence. So therefore, you have these roles that the other person sees that this is what's expected of them: prudence, faith, beauty, ecstasy, and then. Um, you got positive rewards, and then you got the negative reinforcement, like uh, len leniency. Some people uh, mistake negative reinforcement for punishment. That's a whole different uh, uh, concept. There, le leniency uh, encourages uh, submissive behaviors by uh, withdrawing negative reinforcement, I mean uh, punishment. 
So, and then uh, these come down here to the second stage where the reinforcement now is actively occurring in anticipation of cooperation in the future, procurement behaviors in the future. So here's the reinforcement. You, I, I dignifiedly desire you in a civilly magnanimous fashion and it ends up in pure love as opposed to aspiration which is uh, a role in the future that you know would, would, would follow back on onto the uh, under the level before it so this is like a recurrent cycle you have uh, desire for reinforcement and then you have reinforcement in anticipation of uh, of cooperative types of behavior and then the cooperative types of behavior go from the future eventually they, be, they come into the present and then you have uh, the active sense up here so uh, it really helps to read the text uh, rather than just summarizing it but uh, like I said I go through each of these uh, describe each of these concepts here and show how they exactly fit into this multimodal uh, sequential pattern. And this is a, like I said, this behavioral foundation here is crucial for understanding even the highest levels of, uh, of virtues and values. So here I, talk, I say that the final thing is all appear linked on an intuitive level, suggesting a clear sense of overall cohesiveness. And so, and the complete breakdown, uh, we're going to describe uh, further on here in the motivational matrix. So here I talk about uh, fledging science of communication theory. And this borrows the uh, concept of the meta perspective, where this is how I see you seeing me. And you can go to the meta meta perspective. This is how I see you seeing me seeing you. And um, ultimately, you can get to the tenth order meta perspective, where you uh, get to the highest virtues and values. And, but you don't have to keep all these levels in mind. It's like you kind of focus in on the level you're on. It's like walking up a s staircase. You're you, you got the two stairs that you're on and the one you're going up to. So that's uh, it, this is very feasible as far as the capacity for the human mind to fathom all these three levels of abstraction here. So, so I talk about the, these four, these traditional groupings are divided in the four subordinate terms that we've seen and it pr it permits precise point for point stacking like we saw in the hierarchy there. And uh, the reason it's broken into four is because of the uh, dynamics I was talking about, about the behaviorism, behavioral conditioning being a sequence. Of, and only one can be active in the present at any given time. They can follow very quickly, but sometimes there's a big lag time. You, you may not want to reward one of your employees or something until uh, the time is right. So this is uh, moving on. Uh, so we got, uh, this has been explained, like I said, with the hierarchy of meta-perspectives. But nobody has made a hierarchy of meta-perspectives to a tenth order level. Or like I said, could even go beyond that. So um, here this, uh, we talk about the personal, uh, the, the individual is incorporated into broad range of group contexts and they have personal interactions and, and even uh, all-encompassing universal contexts as in uh, you know being a member of the global community that is the universal and then Emmanuel Kant he came up with uh, this uh, kind of uh, Format. There's a unit set, which is the personal. There's a group set, and then a universal set, 
is a group of all groups. So this is strict Venn diagram uh, uh, mathematics here. But then, the, like I said, there's levels higher than that. I talk, I talk about this three-level hierarchy. Uh, differs. Uh, it differs uh, because uh, it's further specialized in the, in the authority and follower roles, as uh, as um, mentioned in the uh, conditioning theory uh, provisions there. So then, uh, further on, then I, I talk about this. Uh, Hierarchy of spiritual, personal group and spiritual, your personal authority, one-to-one -one style of interaction. And then uh, the group authority perspective, multitude of elements, okay, or class members. And then, um, like I said, the group follower, we, we look at, I, I'm examining about the, uh, the tension between labor and management. Okay, the management is the authority, and the uh, and the union uh, collective is the uh, the followers. The rank of file. They nominate a shop steward to represent them in negotiations with management. So, and the group representative reminds the group authority that without their cooperation, his authority is worthless. To, to an extent. So, uh, I mean, they can always, uh, some of them try and get uh, higher strike breakers and whatever, but uh, on a general conceptual level, one hand needs the other to wash, it, wash the other. So then the same thing goes on with the uh, universal or spiritual realm, where I talk about it's a third order set hierarchy equivalent to the domain of all of mankind. And uh, here you got the you got the spiritual authority and you got your spiritual congregation as the followers. And, and this claim to universality has historically been made through an appeal to God or Messiah theory. Where a king could inspire the loyalty of his troops in the name of a god of war in a far in excess we claim as a mere mortal ruler. And we see that in Egypt, we see that in the Middle East, in China, and all across the globe. Even in uh, American societies, uh, the Maya. And, uh, so this, this, these are all common themes that we, we, we know it intuitively, but uh, like I said, can spell it out with uh, Venn diagrams here. So uh, I talk about how these are all, they're all mo united together as a motivational matrix, I call it, because it's based in be behavioral conditioning and it incorporates the first three levels. But then, uh, okay, here here is the diagram. This, this shows the, what, the, the namings of the groupings here. We got the uh, the most basic level is the ego states. You got the outer ego states, and then the um, in the group you got the personal ideals, the cardinal virtues. That's those are the, these are the follower roles, what I call a group representative. And then uh, we go to spiritual. You got uh, these are all uh, providence, liberty, civility, austerity. These are all kind of mentioned somewhat in the Declaration of Independence where they call them for God-given rights and universal. People have uh, universal rights and, and not to be uh, abused by monarch, monarchs or authority. And then we have the uh, theological virtues. These are the disciple roles. Faith, hope, charity, decency. And like I said, these all have secular connotations too even though they're mentioned as a grouping in the uh, certain of the scriptures. And then we're going up to the, like I said, the group of all groups, overall, overall time, historical time, traditional time. You get your ecumenical ideals and grace and free will. These are all topics that have uh, 
more, more a lasting significance in theology and uh, ethics. And then you got the uh, classical Greek values, uh, Plato, Aristotle, they were very big on these. Beauty, truth, goodness, and uh, they, usually, they usually talk about the three, but uh, I found that wisdom, wisdom is another value that was highly prized. That fits right in here and makes the four-part grouping. And then we come down here to the humanistic values, where we, uh, it looks at a transcendental perspective, where the power is gained by surpassing all of the limitations of the other ones. So these are just uh, timeless and ageless, and, and, and uh, they, they go beyond the concreteness of all these uh, lower levels so that you have the pure essence here. Peace, love, tranquility, equality. I mean, what could be higher than that? But then you see, you got you to look at the follower role here. You got the mystical values. And these are right, I, I quote uh, William James. Uh, he was very big on the varieties of mystical experience. And he mentions all of these in one of his chapters. Ecstasy, bliss, joy, and harmony. And uh, like I said, there even is potential to go down to what you call a supernatural authority. But it, it, it's these are so close in, in uh, meaning that uh, they seem to blend together. I mean, this is really the highest uh, nameable level where you can distinguish. Down, down here, this would probably be like a kind of a super unified field of uh, ethics and morality. So here we show, uh, this is, like I said, you can always refer back to this diagram here as far as the names and the, and the authority levels. And, and like I said, they all have four terms each. I mean, this is, uh, this is beyond coincidence that these, these groupings that have mostly been named by the ancients Aristotle, Plato, and the and great church fathers, that these all will just line up in perfect order like this. Thanks to the hierarchy of the meta perspectives. Um, when I first started by s developing my system, I had just the basic two levels, and then I saw, wow, you can go to group level, glory, honor, dignity, integrity. And then I saw that uh, there were the cardinal virtues, so I had four. And then I kept just researching and expanding down, and eventually, like I said right here, the, uh, this is my first big, real huge insight. Because I was building, and I said, hey, that's got to be the better perspective format. You know? And then and right away, I grabbed my dictionary, I, I knew there were some cardinal virtues, and I looked at it, I go, wow, those fit. And then I said, well, there's some theological virtues here also. And a little modification. Usually the, the faith, hope, and charity is, uh, is considered, but uh, decency also is mentioned in the scriptures. So then uh, I could say, well, they, then I figured out that there's different authority levels involved, you know. And, uh, and then, uh, I, I, then the, the classical Greek values. I said, this is too good to be true. I mean, there's three, could be four, like I said here. And so I expanded to a humanitarian level and then the transcendental, I, I knew. Originally this was up here, but then when I, when I discovered the mystical values, then this made us all nice, nice steady columns. And, uh, and this is a this, uh, this, uh, basis for, uh, Contrast with the with the vices, vices of defect, vices of excess. I, I do not go through this in this dissertation. I stick with the virtues because I was uh, I have a word limit, you know. But uh, I have a lot of other writing done where um, where you can expand this out. I figure there's 1,040 individual terms. But uh, I'm going to stay on, on course now for the virtues and values. And what I've said here is uh, 
I talk about the uh, distinction like I already have been talking about with the humanitarian and transcendental levels and why they are included in this system. So rather than go uh, more about this, I'd like to scroll down to the uh, the uh, power of abstraction and uh, uh, person uh, here the personal ethical foundations and the rest of this chapter I, I uh, break it down into authority roles it just describes the, the diagram in more detail and, and some how these how these were, were brought about in traditional um, ethical in inquiry then uh, ascending all the way to the humanistic values, peace, love, tranquility, and quality. That's the highest transcendental level. And each of these was worshipped as a god in their own right. The Romans, they worshipped all of these. Pox is peace, Cupid, love, quiet, tranquility, and equitas, equality. So there, there's so many different... Uh, validations and foundations for these that, it, that my job was very easy because I, I just had to round up the different groupings and, and find out how they fit into the system. So scrolling ahead to uh, the uh, uh, in this section I talk about the, uh, the foundations for the follower roles and these are the uh, like I said these are mostly the virtues and values the cardinal virtues the theological virtues and the classical Greek values, and these are the uh, these are the roles that are expected. When you talk about virtue, it's what you should do, what we ought to do. This is the level of uh, like utilitarianism and consequentialism. What is best for the greatest number? Whereas in the uh, in the preceding authority roles. That's more of a, that's an active, active, active uh, type of behavioral category. And that could, that's concerned with deont deontological ethics, where the uh, where rules are met and they can't be broken because it's going on right away. Whereas there's more flexibility as far as the virtues and values and what, 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 should, what should be done within the future, which is all relates back to the behavioral uh, sequence. Where one role is active, one rule, one role occurs within the future, and eventually becomes actualized as an active role. So, uh, like I said, uh, I, I in this section I bring a lot, bring along the uh, different traditions. How I. Uh, and show, uh, try and show convincingly how they should be included in, at this exact place in the matrix, motivational matrix, because, like I said, every every term relates to every other, and uh, it has a specific uh, place within that matrix. You, there's uh, no other place where it could really fit according to my uh, research here. So scrolling down again, we, we got the uh, theological virtues, we hear the cardinal virtues here, and then if we scroll down, uh, we get the, uh, get the uh, humanitarian uh, levels there. Here we got the humanitarian uh, and then the uh, transcendental. So uh, here we have the, like I said, uh, talking about the uh, overview of the motivational matrix. And I show how each of the trends just builds one on top of another to reach the full five levels for both authority and follower roles. And then scro uh, scrolling down, we got the uh, yeah. They line up perfectly within its respective quadrant of the virtuous hierarchy. 
Uh, I, I, this uh, dissertation, I, you have to read it slowly to really digest really the, uh, the finer points on this, but then I, I'd like to talk about the uh, global ethical applications. This is kind of a preview of, of my final conclusions. But I, I like to talk about the, uh, the honorable assistance on fair business dealings, as well as integrity with respect to equitable commerce. And this, uh, this is a crucial part of, of maintaining peace in the world, because there's always people that want to get around being cooperative and, and doing their share in the economy. And, whether one makes a widget or is on a production line or in charge of a huge company, coordinating everything. We all have to work together. And I, I think once people realize that it all is one big motivational matrix and they get the firm understanding, they'll, they'll want to work together. I mean, it's going to be the right thing to do, you know. Even, even without having God looking over your shoulder telling you that you'd be good, you want to do it for you and everybody else. Because if, uh, if there's enough people that uh, do, not, do not cooperate, maybe we see today there's uh, this whole system can be undermined. And, and with the global connectivity we have, it's, it's not really worth the risk, you know. If nobody wins, everybody loses. So it's, uh, I'm sure some of you are reading along anyway while, we're, while I'm talking, so uh, it's, uh, it's what I said to hear about the, there's, uh, like I said, there's also, the, you want to you uh, promote the virtues and then avoid the vices. Aristotle introduces the vices of defect. And how they, you can look at uh, vice of defect as, as the direct opposite of the virtue. So in peace you got war, for love you have hate, you know, for goodness there's evil, and, and there's an entire parallel hierarchy that can show you, that it's an application of this basic system which shows how, how you can avoid these these uh, unnecessary uh, interruptions and defects to society as a whole. I know it's going to be a hard sell for maybe people that have been raised in a criminal culture and everything, but uh, I, I got a strong faith in the human conscience that people will do the right thing if they have, have the uh, ability to see all that. And then here I talk, talk uh, the next chapter, I'm um, just introduction in the next chapter, I, I show exactly what I was talking about here, the uh, B.F. Skinner and the uh, principles of operant conditioning and, and showing how this can uh, be based entirely within a behavioral terminology, the virtues and values. And uh, so this is a, uh, Shows how even our secular world values uh, psychology and uh, behavioral psychology, and a lot. A lot there's a lot of it, uh, cognitive psychology is more popular now, but that also plays into this. So this uh, this wraps up the uh, current chapter, and we're going ahead to chapter two. Uh, like I said, this uh, dissertation is roughly 70,000 words, so I, I can uh, really basically just give an overview, but here in this section, uh, conditioning in a natural setting, where uh, I, talk, I look at the great um, conditioning psychologists, uh, for instrumental conditioning is as it was originally called, because uh, behaviors are instrumental in, in receiving reinforcement. Uh, but uh, Skinner introduced the radically, radical variation on it, the term operant conditioning, 
where the, the organism operates on the environment to produce the reinforcement. You just don't wait passively for, uh, for the food or water to come to you. You, you go out and you procure it, and, you, and then you, you can maintain a stable equilibrium. And so, uh, <clears throat> scrolling down here, we, well, let's talk about negative, uh, we'll talk about positive reinforcement, but negative reinforcement, you, uh, you want to avoid negative consequences in the environment is uh, fleeing from predators or stepping around pitfalls. These are very unforgiving uh, types of uh, consequences in the environment. And uh, so actually negative reinforcement may, might even prove more critical than positive. And then we see a lot of that in, in conflicts around the world and war where Where the you know the uh, defect aspect enters in, because we can't cooperate, uh, be lenient, and everybody get along. So, uh, so we talk about how Skinner's did his experiments, and that's uh, somewhat technical. But then we go down to the condi conditioning in a social setting. Where, where I talk about how these behavioral terms relate to society, or like I said, the uh, so, so certain uh, social animal societies uh, groom, the, groom their coats or the breeding behaviors. Uh, but within human society, uh, reinforcement is most often abstracted as uh, uh, money or power, praise, commendation. Paper currency is not ple and pleasing in itself, but you can exchange it for all those things. So, um, mankind—that's that's the only way you could create this culture—is to have these uh, inner inner relationships and uh, able to exchange goods and services back and forth. So uh, here we got the social hierarchy and uh, the wolf pack in, in negative reinforcement. The feeder wolf bears his throat and then the dominant wolf uh, leniently terminates the conflict because uh, the, the, the feeder wolf uh, submits. So and then we see that even in, in, in war where you wave the white flag and everything. And then the human correlation here, connection. Uh, you see that uh, there's specialized uh, agencies within the social hierarchy. And this is uh, evident in the workplace. And uh, the employee performs a service function in exchange for reinforcement. So this is uh, the, the grand basis for the uh, Ground basis for uh, reinforcement procurement in general. And uh, <clears throat> here we get to this uh, this diagram here. This this is my bread and butter diagram here. Uh, you, you got, you got, in the present, you got the authority role. Authority is solicitous or submissive in uh, anticipation of the reinforcement, the follower role, which follows that. And see, it's, this is, uh, these wedges here, this is a past, present, and future. And these wedges expanded out because the future and the past grow and the farther you get from the present here. So uh, then you got the uh, approval and lenient, leniency. And then down here, the, the second stage, the reinforcement shifts into the present through the passive advance of time. Eventually, the re time for reinforcement comes to pass. And this is the Y here. Yeah, X is procurement, Y is reinforcement. So you have Y down out here in the present. And then 
this reinforcement uh, further uh, promotes and encourages uh, uh, future procurement behaviors as experienced by the follower as aspiration or compliance. And then if it's phase shifted one step further, then these, these become active and then you arrive back here and here where X, X, Y, Y, X, and then X, Y again. So it's a, like I said, it's a recurrent cycle. It's seamless. It's going on all the time. We're always in some kind of cycle or another. Whether we're working, unless we're total hermits, then none of this applies. And uh, so here I explain that diagram and in more uh, detail, this cyclic recursive periodicity emerges as a key factor where such motivational interchanges accumulate in a seamless fashion over real time. And we, we, can, we can isolate the individual stages, but like I said, it's, it's really just a, a flow that occurs. And that's how uh, we end up cooperating with each other and, you know, on a personal level here. These are all personal themes, personal terms here that, that I, I devised for these. Desire, worry, and then, like I said, the, uh, I, I, I turn them the, the ego states are the authority roles and then the outer ego states are the follower roles. So moving on, I said we, uh, I examine all of these, I spell out all the different parameters here for the initial authority roles here and then scrolling down to uh, the, uh, there's a follower, the follower roles, talk about the uh, and then the next stage is this desire and the aspirations that are going on. I talk of this about this in a human social context. And then uh, I said this is a lot of detail that it's beyond the scope of this. And then I talk about the recursive correlates for conditioning and about the long tradition of uh, recursion communication theory as well as other fields of science. Then I have a summary section here where I talk about the uh, interplay as it relates to positive. All of this was about positive reinforcement. But then I have in this next section here talk about uh, negative reinforcement. A submissiveness in anticipation of leniency. This is a very big uh, dynamic in a lot of social structure where the uh, subordinate submits to the uh, authority figure. And then, uh, so this all explains that dynamic in a similar fashion. And uh, and we get to the second stage, worry compliance. That's, that mirrors the uh, desire dash aspiration seen in the positive sense. And I talk about a drill uh, sar uh, example of a drill sergeant and the crew. And um, so that makes for kind of an interesting reading for those who, who've been in that situation. And then scrolling on further here, we got the uh, talking about the role reversal that occurs when uh, during the second stage of the interaction, where the drill sergeant now worrisomely acts in a concerned fashion towards the recruit, therefore encouraging the recruit to be more brave and compliant and. Uh, this uh, removes a lot of frictions from such a structured like, military context there. So, uh, and then moving ahead, we got the accessory terms where 
the subjective you, I perspective and the, and the you perspective, these are reversed. Where, where uh, if I then you, and you can also have uh, from the, on the part of the person you're communicating with, then if you then I. So you have a complete, complete subjective, objective uh, interplay. There's n nobody's perspective is left out at all. And so this is, uh, we're going to talk about accessory later on in an upcoming chapter here. So, uh, so here's, the, uh, here's a diagram here for the accessory hierarchy of virtues and values. Dropping down here. These terms are not as well known as, as the, the major traditions that we, that we show, the cardinal virtues. But these are all uh, synonyms. If you are able to compare the two diagrams closely, you'll see that they are all uh, close synonyms of one another. And uh, that, that permits everybody's perspective to be respected. So this is uh, 40 terms, just like the uh, original virtues were 40. 4 times 10 is 40, yeah. Okay, moving along, we got the uh, authority of follower roles. We talked about that. One hand is always needed to wash the other. So the follower leads the leader as much as the leader leads the follower. And uh, this is a popular maxim of, uh, of the Eastern cultures, and it sure rings true in this system. And so uh, I talk about the, how this any higher perspectives are based within a meta-perspective format, utilizing uh, you know, higher groups, spiritual, humanitarian, etc. Uh, and data points there. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, here I talk about R. D. Lang here. He he was uh, very big on the meta perspective as well as uh Watslavic, he's another one and uh, so I, I, I rely very heavily on them. And then here we talk about, here I sum up the conditioning, uh, conditioning theory argument here of, uh, of why, why these can be named and, and the utility of doing so. And uh, so uh, I talk about the 10 level hierarchy again. And, uh, Oh, and I think the audience is going to really like this. The schematic definitions for the virtues and values and ideals. And here we spell out in longhand exactly the, where the authorities and follower roles are and show how they build one level on another. So you got the preliminary power maneuver, which is currently being expressed, and then you got the counter maneuver where the uh, other party can regain power. And so here's an example of a schematic definition. Um, group authority, um, gloriously acts solicitously in anticipation of approving treatment. And then you can prudently act approvingly. So you're, you're, you're the follower accentuates the follower role, the group representative role, and, and, and establishes an equal inter, interplay with the authority role. So scrolling down, I have the whole uh, listing of tables in here uh, for the main terms, the accessory terms. But this, these definitions uh, seem with the group level, the uh, preliminary terms drop out of the definitions. For freeing up space for the newer terms currently being introduced, maintaining a stable buffer. So, uh, it'd be good to see uh, a table there here. Uh, okay, here's a table for the first dimension. So, the interplay of the uh, personal authority 
and then the personal follower, Connor Ox, and then the uh, group authority rises to the next higher level and uh, comes in with gloriously acts listed. And the follower prudently acts approvingly, and so on. All the, 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 the terms that are underlined here are, uh, are the ones that are being introduced. Providence, faith, Grace, beauty, and by beauty I mean uh, beauty in terms of the uh, of a beautiful character, not necessarily just physical beauty, but beauty that a person really exudes and people want to be around. You know, so this is just the first of four tables. Um, I can uh, hope you can um, see the pattern. That, it's more important to see the, the pattern and the hierarchy that emerges. And uh, so um, this, uh, this first page of definitions extends down, scrolling down into the, uh, these are definitions based on solicitous approval and then uh, and we have them based on submissiveness, leniency. You get all the uh, all the uh, virtues and values based on uh, negative reinforcement, so to speak. And you get oh, these these are all the the biggies in the social justice field. You know, you got your you got your justice here, and you, you got liberty here. You got truth over here. You got equality down here. Nobody's ever brought them together in one big page like this. And, and, and look at these the detail in these definitions. I mean, it's this is so detailed. I I was granted a U.S. patent for artificial and ethical artificial intelligence. And so this this is the key to. Uh, Getting along with our hardware brother, brethren, as well as getting along with each other as participants in society. So that this is a authority club first and follower, and then when we see down further, we got the, uh, the authority as the reinforcer now. We uh, rewardingly act desirously. This is based on desire, aspiration, and it goes all the way down the highest level to love and joy. I mean, you wouldn't think you could jump like that, but when you see all the intermediate steps, it's very clear how this could come apart, come, up, come about, I mean. And then the next, the final set of definitions, the same uh, schema, but it has to do with uh, negative reinforcement. Worris worrisomely, act leniently, intolerantly, and, and uh, integrity, and, a lot of these are big in social justice field here too. Wisdom, peace, equanimity, austerity, integrity. I mean, this it just uh, boggles the mind to think that, that the people using the language 2,000 years ago were sharp enough to, to name these terms and, uh, and then have them fit all together like this. I mean, it's... Uh, when you look at it, that's how language evolves. To uh, you got a need to express something, you make a word for it. And fortunately, through the genius of Plato and Aristotle, they put it in groupings enough so that this this kind of system could could come apart, be realized, and come and come about. So uh, I'm scrolling down again to the uh, we're going on to chapter three here. It's uh, this, these uh, next uh, grouping, four, three, four chapters are, are going to deal with each uh, authority level s separately, and uh, there's no reason to go through a lot of detail on this because this uh, just shows the uh, the traditions behind it. I mean, uh, if you can't show a continuous usage uh, through history, then you know, it, and even though language does change, and maybe some of these are not. Maybe originally when they were first developed, like uh, 
honor and uh, justice and everything. They, they, they change it subtly, but uh, we, I talk about the uh, all the group levels and uh, what 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 the research was in, in the field that led up to it. So we have glory, honor, dignity, and integrity, and. Uh, <coughs> Here, then we get the carnal virtues here. The uh, it's a group follower, and there's a whole lot of uh, tradition about this, starting with the classical Greeks and going on to the church theologians, and then even even modern philosophy gets into some of this. So we're going uh, on to the here are the classical traditions. Where I talk about uh, Plato, Socrates. Aristotle, Plato, yeah, Aristotle got it from Plato, this, uh, as far as the, uh, the uh, cardinal virtues. It talks about the uh, follower, and then the, and then the uh, Romans got it. Have a, the Latinized versions are the ones that uh, Prudentia, Justitia, Temperatus, Fortitio. You can see where the uh, the real terms came from. The Romans uh, went on to uh, serve as the basis for the later Christianity, where the church fathers kind of adapted these. And so, uh, going beyond the cardinal virtues and the group realm, we have the uh, You have got glory and prudence then. This shows the, uh, the behavioral interplay of these, uh, of the authority and the follower roles. Glory, prudence, and then, then uh, later on we have honor, justice. So you see a good interplay and uh, here I talk about, I give examples of everything. So. Uh, that have happened uh, like in Plato's Republic where he introduces all these cardinal virtues and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> they're just, uh, like I said, it uh, makes for more interesting reading to get the, actually get the personal examples and, and, and show how they, they do fit into this schematic definition format. So then, then it, this goes on to the interplay of dignity and temperance, where the uh, reinforcer acts first, and, and the follower role is uh, you should be temperately aspiring, you know. Uh, okay, so scrolling down again, we have the uh, get into the negative reinforcement. See, these are all details uh, for validating the system. Honor justice here starts uh, honorably, you honorably act submissively in anticipation of just treatment. Otherwise, yeah, and justice builds on leniency. I could talk about here. Leniency in response to submissive types of behavior. And then I, I return to the wolf pack example, you know, uh, and, and you see this in society all the time, where uh, you've got this interplay dynamic. So going on down to, yeah, I get into the uh, honor, the Romans uh, personified on. Uh, honor is ono, onos. And they even built shrines to him, the Chi Temple, yeah. They had a temple for every abstract god, just about. And uh, so this, this is not just a current development. This, this has precedents going way back as far as, as written language here. And I talk about the jury trial here, and uh, uh, yeah, as it relates to justice, British common law. And, uh, and we have them in, the, in this section here. We're going over to uh, the negative reinforcement. I mean, yeah, yeah, 
integrity, worrisome integrity is kind of like reinforcement and anticipation of uh, compliant fortitude. Fortitude, which is another name for bravery or courage. And that's what's expected from the uh, recruit on the battle, uh, on when the time comes to perform his duty. You know? And then I refer, I refer back here to the, uh, the figure 2A where X, Y, Y, X, it all depends on which is active at the, at the given time there. So we talk about the uh, recursive uh, role reversals. Integrity has a long standing tradition. And uh, I'll give some examples of that. Even in medieval heraldry, popular uh, on, on shield arrangements and so forth. And then uh, talk about uh, fortitude here. Uh, bravery and fortitude and everything is, is what maybe we all aspire to. To uh, I know there's people that are now radically individualists and they, they don't want to do their part for society. Everybody needs to pull forward when, it, when it's time to stand up for what's right. And uh, so here I give, oh, I talk about the commanding officer and the soldier recruit. And then, like I said, this, uh, this can all be uh, mirrored by the accessory uh, perspectives where I talk about that in a later chapter, the exact diagram of that. But I give hints at it early on in the, in the narration here. So moving ahead, we're going to go to the next chapter four. Like I said, this one, it's got the same basic uh, format as uh, the previous one, only it's now the spiritual universal realm. And I, I talk about the need for the human mind to, to see things in a universal sense, first with religion, then with uh, the global uh, community we're in. And so I, I, I trace the whole uh, spectrum of uh, back through early civilizations here, uh, pre-scientific, uh, mentality, uh, priests, and the, uh, the only way they could really uh, claim that is to claim divinity, you know, uh, direct lineage from the gods or, or something that people would really get behind, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, that in Egypt and uh, all, uh, virtually every culture it's the promise of afterlife. It's enough to really keep people in, in, in line if they know they will be rewarded in the afterlife. So, so then we uh, talk about the Christian origins and stuff here. And then uh, we have the modern perspectives. I talk about uh, the Declaration of Independence, like I said previously, where uh, we created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So this appeal to divinity kind of, uh, that uh, universality, in contrast to the royalist perspective, you know, where the king could just do whatever he wanted to, you know. So they're on the right track and, and lo and behold, the majority of the world's countries now are, are uh, admire, admire our contribution and have come to kind of a similar parliamentary form of government here, rather than a monarchy or a dictatorship. And then so scrolling down, this is all history, civics you had in history, a Bill of Rights, and then uh, well we get to the theological virtues, which are, which are talked about a lot in the Christian scripture and uh, This is uh, 
talks about the Protestant Re Re Reformation, and uh, this is the, just the disciple role. You know, as everybody talks about being having faith in your religion, and hoping for a good outcome, and being charitable to others, and that this is what really our the Western culture is based on, even though it's. It's not followed so closely now because, because kind of Christianity is uh, falling out of favor because of its ex exclusivity. But uh, together with this new system, a behavioral foundation for the secular, then all the all these are acceptable. So here we talk about how they're talked about in scripture and. and it, <coughs> And then I talk about here, this is going to be a common feature, uh, how, um, how one, one little builds on the other here. So we talk about a prudent faith, a just hope, a temperate charitableness, and a decent sense of fortitude. So you can kind of see the, how it's building up. And uh, it's very, very hard to ignore this kind of pattern. When you, when you see it, especially when they're all were to tra traditionally um, derived and everything and accepted over the ages. So uh, I don't want to say too much more about this chapter because uh, talk about the behavioral foundation there. Every, you can still see the behavioral foundation going back when you go through intervening levels here. So. Uh, then I, I, I break it down into the more more immediate uh, sequences, acting providently, in anticipation of faith, the authority figure and the follower, and then that that uh, segues down through all these uh, examples into the uh, next sequence, which is the. Uh, Next sequence is the uh, civility in anticipation of charity. Here the reinforcement is incur occurring. The civilly act dig dignified the, towards the uh, follower in anticipation of their uh, charitable, uh, temperate, temperately charitable uh, treatment in some, at some future occasion here. So, uh, yeah, this... Uh, I give example of the abbot and the monk, and uh, also other other examples from uh, from classical mythology, and then heading down to uh, the uh, even civil rights precedents and everything. Civil Rights Act of uh, 1871. I, I mentioned so all of them. It's been a, a progress of. Uh, of uh, social justice and even uh, talk about uh, uh, events that I remember even uh, 1955. Well, I was still a little infant then, but uh, this was still a common currency for quite a while to come here. And uh, so I, sh I show our civility and. Uh, Charity, uh, yeah, and then we we uh, I'll stop here briefly to talk about the negative reinforcement. Uh, liberty is the uh, based on a, a, a submissiveness. Submissiveness uh, do not do wrong to other people. Uh, avoid uh, infringing on their rights. And you do that in the, in, in the hope that they will be lenient back to you. Okay, so talk about the uh, spiritual authority, spiritual follower, interaction, and uh, talk about here the histories of uh, liberty here. Libertas, that was uh, the Romans uh, worship liberty as libertas. And, and you see her stylized in, in kind of the uh, Statue of Liberty. You know? <clears throat> we are talking about that aspect of it. The 
Statue of Liberty and uh, how liberty uh, leads to uh, feelings of hope on the, on the opposing party that you're communicating with, but this time in a universal uh, dimension here. So yeah, there's uh, a lot of background, and then you got the next uh, stage of uh, austerity is kind of a form of um, lenient reinforcement in anticipation of decent treatment on the part of the uh, follower figure. So I, yeah, I, I periodically refer back to that diagram and show how it's still applicable, even at this extreme level of universal authority. You know, that uh, it's all meta perspectives coming through and building on one another here. So let's, uh, before spending any more time on this, uh, we'll skip ahead to the uh, humanitarian realm. Yeah, this, uh, and, uh, people in conservation and uh, that value ritual and tradition, they're, they're very big on this uh, on humanitarian, what's good for all of mankind all of the time, going forward and looking back to ritual and history and everything. Speak, he claims to speak for all generations of mankind, not just the current ones. So it may seem like a fine, a fine distinction, but uh, it definitely has the different terminology to distinguish that. So we have the grand humanitarian perspective. And uh, even uh, they say the Western Roman Empire was the uh, was just kind of the standard bearer of uh, of the classical perspective, and then the church took over here, talking about the uh, during the dark ages, the truth that church is really the uh, the authority to go to, the keeper of the learning and everything. They kept the Roman tradition alive enough uh, in their ecclesiasticism to. Uh, so here you see the. Uh, Magnanimity re represents the humanitarian, humanitarian counterpart for civility. Equanimity gives a similar refinement of austerity. And then further down here we have the uh, and grace. Grace represents higher form of providence. The providence is more immediate, whereas grace implies a, a sweeping span. Same with free will. Free will is for all time. Liberty is kind of more immediate. So uh, yeah, the rest of this chapter, I uh, to show the role of uh, classical Greek values and the ecumenical ideals. Here's the motivational interplay for the humanitarian role. Here we see that build, how they build again, the bodious faith, just hope, just hope for the truth. See, some of them, even, you can even bring the, the third subordinate term in, charitable goodness and decent wisdom. I mean, this it just rolls off the tongue. I mean, it just makes so much sense when you look at it in this manner here. So, but you're not off the hook yet because we still have the transcendental chapter to go. I mean, you would think with grace and beauty you'd be kind of hitting the upper end there, but, uh, and uh, this is really mostly what what's applicable today. I mean, you don't really get so much in the transcendental unless you get into a religious kind of perspective. But, uh, like I say, we'll, uh, this this uh, thesis will be available for anybody who wants to really read all these details and, and get the overall. But here we got the got magnanimity and anticipation of goodness from the follower figure. And uh, like I said, uh, when you, 
the fact that I can go through all of this and just off the top of my head, you, you must know by now that I have developed this, I've lived this for the past few decades here and uh, I, I've really developed this to the point where uh, like free will and truth where it's very difficult to ignore the parallels, even though in theology and all of that, they they never really they re never really saw the, the parallels between the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues and the classical Greek values. So here we go at the end here we have equanimity, wisdom, and. Um, <coughs> So let's go ahead and scroll down to the transcendental chapter. We'll give a little, just a little bit of lip service on that. Uh, chapter six, transcendental, and uh, I give a little background on that. Immanuel Kant talked about before he, he was very big in the transcendental and transcendence and eminent. These are all specialized philosophy terms. But uh, rolling down here, then we got the, uh, the New, New England Transcendentalism. This was the big 19th century uh, movement. And uh, this served as the inspiration for the modern day revival. You know, like the war protest of the early 70s. They uh, really really into peace, love, tranquility, and equality. Now, this part was when I was uh, at the high school age, and uh, these were all big uh, big terms, and I, I call these the humanistic values because, you know, humanistic psychology became big at the same time, and, uh, and they co-opted a lot of these themes uh, for humanistic psychology, and uh, it hasn't uh, died down yet, so uh, humanistic values. Peace represents a transcendental modification and equanimity. Love attaches to uh, grace, tranquility. Uh, like I said, uh, you look at the diagram, you see that this is the only possible explanation of how these would fit in. So, uh, okay, uh, rolling down. In this chapter, I, I, I examine them individually because they're so abstract. You know, why try and uh, link these? Uh, but I, I do show the, the traditions of peace here. Peace uh, from the uh, from the Roman era through the scripture down to the uh, and then to love. Love is boy. That's that's a theme that never goes away. Or, um, rather than romantic love, we're talking about agape, love for transcendental pure love. Which doesn't mean that that's not included in romantic love. But we are mag magnanimously act lovingly towards you in anticipation of your goodly sense of joy towards me. So this, this is the highest nameable realm here. Where uh, I mean, uh, when when you include the mystical values, the joy, ecstasy, peace, joy, harmony, this uh, all this uh, love, tranquility is the next one, and then uh, that that goes back to the Romans, scrolling down, and then the uh, talk about tranquility and the environment and the tranquilizer. I, I take I take uh, examples from all over the spectrum, where it it, it's, it shows uh, applications here. And then equality, this is a very abstract term, but uh, this is what uh, our, com our country, uh, the United States, was founded on, more or less, and uh, <coughs> so I, I talk about some of the. Uh, Enlightenment uh, philosophers, their take on things, and hey, the Declaration of Independence shows up again. United Nations Universal 
Declaration, which states all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So we got all of, all our terms in there, more or less, and, and you can show how they how they uh, through my master diagram show how they're all fit together. So you don't have to look at them separately. You can look at them as the whole spectrum here. So go, going down here, we got the uh, mystical values. And these are the last ones I developed because they're, they're, they're really so, they're almost synonyms of each other. But scrolling down, I, I give the hit, uh, history of the mystical experience from William James. He was a big influence. I, I, I adapted these mystical values right out of one of his chapters, you know. He, he's a genius before his time. I, too bad he, he didn't have the advantage of the uh, ethical hierarchy, you know, I mean, he could have gone even further. But he, he used a, a shortcut, to kind of uh, uh, nitrous oxide gave him a mystical experience. So he was able to uh, kind of analyze the mystical experience. And uh, Yeah, this is something that's not recommended though, because like I say, it's and in our day and age, it's a carefully controlled substance. But in his, these pioneering days, they, they, they were pioneering the field. So uh, that's how it got into dentistry. <laughs> so uh, I, I talk about saintliness and uh, some of the major saints and everything. And uh, talk about the... The mystical experience, you, like I said, you've got to almost experience it to know what it is. It's so out there. Ecstasy, I, I talk about these individuals, ecstasy. Very, very briefly here, scrolling down, you got uh, Bliss, Joseph Campbell, he's talking about, always talk, following one's bliss. and that, That's a higher analog of truth, you know. You, so, um, and, and joy is a higher analog of uh, of goodness. It's a, like a procurement kind of thing, and then uh, harmony. And so that's boy, that's just way out. That's uh, in my title. Peace, peace. Uh, harmony is the follower role, whereas peace is the transcendental authority role. And they and they, they, they draw our eyes from Greek harmonia, fitting together in agreement. So you got, even on this advanced level, you can see the uh, behavioral foundations free, free and clear there. And then here I get into speculation about what lies beyond that. Supernatural, here I talk about how they, they, uh, the meanings tend to blend, so at the next higher level it's, it's maybe just a, uh, once unified state and and having to go into all this length uh, i think i'm entitled to speculate a little bit there's others in religion that might disagree but uh but like i said peace love and tranquility the, the, those are all f fairly distinct uh, ecstasy bliss joy and harmony wow those are those are kind of closing in each other and then if you I predict a complete and irrefutable blending of meetings at, at the meta-meta-meta order level of transcendence, you know. Except in a broad, unnameable, except in the broadest supernatural term. But uh, I'm sure there's many people that have been even at that level. Of course, whether they came back or not, that's a different thing. <laughs> but you always come back from the mystical experience. That's good. And that's nameable. So, hey, I'm talking about maybe a universal mind, oversoul, cosmic consciousness, Brahma, and William James even uh, wades in on this too. So, thankfully we've got, gone through the whole hierarchy here, and uh, like I said, you're going to have to uh, get a copy to read the rest of these speculations here. I'm sure they'll be controversial, but... Uh, it's derived from the uh, 
from the subject matter here. And then uh, we can go through that. I, I've talked about the accessory virtues and values before, where where you have a tire parallel uh, hierarchy. The U and I roles are reversed. First, if it's X, then Y, and then Y, then X, and, or U, then I, then I, then U. And this, uh, here's the virtu uh, accessory virtuous hierarchy again. And uh, it shows, shows the hierarchy without all the labeling below. But uh, here are the authority roles and the follower, and then the follower, I mean the, the reinforcer and the uh, procurer of reinforcement. And then we, I, have a, I have a parallel master diagram Scroll down a little more here on the, uh, this shows the uh, uh, parallel to the original diagram we have, where you got the, instead of, uh, instead of giving them unique names, I just say accessory ego states, accessory alter ego states, accessory cardinal virtues. And that's the way we're going to have to distinguish them until a more convincing method can be derived if it can even be derived. But this, uh, this shows how every perspective has a counter perspective. It's you then I or I then you. So uh, I, I, I treat a number of these individually and show the traditions behind them. We'll scroll down through this pretty quickly here because uh, so this is a, I give a little blurb on a, each one of these. Ambition leads to exaltation, which is bountifulness, blessings, serenity, which is a, der a derivative of, of tranquility. But you can see, you kind of see the trend going there. That's why I put them in order like that. You can see the trend going down. Here, here's the, here's the, These are follower roles, admiration, circumspection is prudence, devotion is analog of faith, charm is analog of beauty, and, and rapture is, uh, you know, builds on ecstasy to some degree. And so, uh, and then, I, the, the parallel sequence of terms based on the negative reinforcement, I, I didn't really go, I just listed, showed them, I, I I didn't have really a lot of convincing examples for these, but uh, then, then uh, scrolling down to uh, this, uh, this uh, where the re reinforcement role comes first, passion, respect, same as dignity, courtesy, same as civility, graciousness, same as grace. And, and affection or love, and then uh, then the follower roles: consideration, continence, which is, uh, temperance, and then kindness, which is the uh, same as charity, benevolence, goodness, and uh, uh, gladness, and then uh, final. I got the final ones relating to negative reinforcement here, but that's. Uh, it's just uh, enough detail for this type of uh, dissertation here. There's more I, I, I'm able to do in, in maybe a book format coming up on this. So, um, so let's scroll on out of this. Uh, oh, oh, there's schematic definitions for the accessory realm. And, and that's, uh, let's scroll down to those. It should be coming right up here. Yes, yes, there they are. <laughs> So you can see the same pattern as before with the main terms. These fit in beautifully in this kind of schematic format. And um, it's just amazing that that the language edition came up with the accessory terms as well as the main terms. And, and they fit so perfectly together here. In my opinion, I, I must say. but. Uh, uh, it's, that's table B1. I got a total of B4 up to B4. Here's the uh, here's the ones based on uh, see so freedom instead of liberty. You got 
Echoless instead of uh, Justice. I mean, all of these are really nice synonyms. Um, and then going on to table B3, we get into the uh, reinforcement-based ones. Passionately act rewardingly in anticipation of your considerate treatment of me. And then uh, dig dignity, respectfulness, benevolence, benevolence, uh, goodness. I mean, it's, it's uh, when you when you really uh, outline them out, like I said here, they're, they're, it's really uh, hard to argue. Bravery is, instead of fortitude, you get scrupulousness instead of uh, decency, shrewdness instead of wisdom. I mean, it's uh, it's really a thing of beauty to behold you know, in, in its entirety. You know, I mean. But like I said, I, I, I have broken it down into, it's a scroll all the way down. Uh, kind of a communicational dynamic uh, that I talk about in the dissertation. And uh, then uh, treat myself and the other. It's just a basic uh, example, two-stage communicational dynamic. Uh, but we, we basically got over all that. Uh, that's just a summary kind of thing. Then we have a counter maneuver of the other. And then uh, there's an interplay between I and thou, you and I, however you want to label it here. And then we uh, talk about the different steps within the diagram. And then uh, this over overview of communication in general here. Here we talk, I talk about uh, planning uh, dialogue, anticipation of meeting others, it's what you call the self-dialogue. And you know, we'll, we'll see more about that in the next chapter. Uh, the other uh, deals with uh, virtuous communication and cooperation. And, um, here, here's a good quote up here. Dame Rebecca West wrote, there's no such thing as conversation. It is an illusion. They're only intersecting monologues, that is all. And this really could be nothing closer to the truth because if other people had access to our thoughts, we would never have any privacy. So we put out there what we, what we think of our, ourselves and what, how others will accept us, and they do the same back. And then, through observing uh, their speech and behaviors, we can get a pretty good sense of what's going on. But never absolutely certain. You never know if you're on the end of a practical joke or not until it happens. <laughs> so scrolling down again. Yeah, we're going to the next chapter. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the general unifying themes and uh, how they uh, serve as uh, master overviews of each of the uh, groupings of virtues. Say uh, utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, uh, like overseas, the cardinal virtues, prudent, justice, temperance, and fortitude, which Plato describes in his ideal notion of the city-state. So we're, we're seeing that and, uh, romanticism has a broader focus on universal principles and, and then the follower roles you got uh, you got the ascending sequence of all oh, this sequence really jumps out at you. Pragmatism. Then you go to the group level, utilitarianism. Then you go to the spiritual level or universal ecclesiasticism. This is for the theologians out there. And then a humanitarian level, eclecticism. What's the best from all the different traditions? Which is what I really have been able to do here. And then uh, following uh, the mysticism. So, yeah, private, you, see, you can see the, here's the diagram here that shows how they all fit together here. And uh, it's, this is like a perennial philosophy 
for the ages. I mean, the, I, this, I wouldn't say this is the final word, but it's, it really brings it together here. You, you got your utilitarians out there, and you got your uh, age of romanticism and uh, eclectics out there, humanists, I mean, uh, pragmatists, individualists, you, you got, it's all, it's all here. And it, also, the subsets of, of the virtues and values, which, uh, which they oversee here. And, and believe it or not, there's even an accessory version of this where, uh, yeah, these are the three digit codes. I have kind of developed a coding system for, uh, for labeling these you know, the themes and also the virtues you probably seen in the other diagrams. But this is, uh, this is beyond the scope of this talk here. But scrolling down, we'll get to the accessory. Oh yeah, here, here's individualism. I, I treat them each individually. And uh, talk about the history here. I heard the accessory versions. Yeah, uh, I, it was a kind of a hard uh, struggle sometimes to find the, the correct contrast. But uh, you got quintessentialism is the same kind of individualism, heroism, charisma, evangelism, and uh, in context you can you can really see. It's more more easily to see in the main terms, but when you put it, you can put these also in the schematic definitions, and this, and the, these work equally as well as the other ones. So scrolling down to uh, the, uh, uh, see, I personally, yeah, I interrupt you here. That, like I said, this, I talk about each of these themes in detail, uh, how they are uh, derived and evolved over the ages and stuff. The classical, the contemporary romanticism. This is a big age, the age of romanticism and enlightenment. That's where we get most of our our common themes. Uh, ecumenism, this is that, more, has more of a religious con con uh, connotation, but it also as a uh, humanitarian kind of type of thing, where uh, and then humanism is is really the highest level up there. The humanities, we all owe classics, ethics, poetry, and uh, I, I had a really had a great time researching all these and, and finding all the precedents occur. And then here's the follower themes here. Pragmatism, we'll go through this real quick here. Pragmatism, to see the trend, see the trend. Pragmatism is personal authority. I mean, personal follower. Utilitarianism, group follower, the greatest group, good for the greatest number. And then skipping ahead to uh, ecclesiasticism, which is a theological term, but it is derived from the Greek ecclesia, assembly, okay? So it's a... Uh, Universal uh, and then eclecticism, humanity. What's what's the best uh, synthesizing from all the best traditions, from the many schools of thought? So eclecticism actually kind of oversees all these themes, really. I mean, it's what I was doing uh, to begin with, you know, getting the eclectic viewpoint here. And then finally, the uh, mystical values, uh, mystical is a theme for the mystical values. Yeah, some of these are uh, taken from the, uh, the and then the, yeah. uh, put them in the schematic definition format and uh, scrolling down, even though this is not as convincing as for the uh, individual terms, you can see the dynamic at work here. I mean, it's like a stepwise hierarchy and uh, you can see when the, uh, Universal and humanitarian authority and all these enter in, and it just really makes for a nice roundabout kind of uh, synthesis of all of them. I mean, uh, I really don't know any any fields of philosophy that would really fall too much outside of these. Like I said, I was saying earlier, 
This column deals with the de deontological aspects of philosophy, where active action, I mean, uh, like uh, Kant was talking about, uh, it, it's very inflexible. There's, there's rules and you've got to follow them and there's no exceptions. But then when you go over here to the uh, future directed uh, trends, the follower trends, and you got the uh, you got the uh, what they call utilitarianism generally or consequentialism. What's good for uh, the greatest number? And you can see that theme in all of these. Okay, so this is like a, a revolution in ethics because you got people who have been long arguing how do we reconcile deontological strict ethics with uh, with the few, with uh, what's what's practical what's expedient what's the best for the best number of people and it's all right here I think <laughs> so scrolling down uh, hey we got hey we got the accessory terms here here are the, the main virtuous themes and then scrolling down here, here's the counterparts and they were they work equally well in this uh, format, more or less. I mean, some of these are, are, are not, not too often used, like, you know, I quit, quit the sessionalism. That's the best uh, match I could find. But, uh, and uh, like I said, the language always changes. Sometimes these, sometimes these fall out of meaning. They might be in another foreign language, you know. I mean, there's, there's very big potential for cross-cultural translations. In fact, for the, just to make any difference on the global uh, sphere, then, uh, like I said, we need everybody to speak in any language to be able to get the benefits of this kind of system. So scrolling down here, uh, accessory, uh, top here's, Here's the here's the terms uh, without being in the without being in individual boxes, but it shows the uh, progression somewhat. Like I said, this uh, we're still a work in progress. I mean, maybe I'll be I'll, I'll be contacted by people that say I have a better word that will go in here, and I I am all for that. I mean, I'm I'm open for any kind of feedback to make this the best system possible, and so. Uh, Let's just scroll through the rest of this. Uh, like I said, I pretty much explained all of it. This, uh, let's back up a little bit, though. Uh, one more page. All right, here. Uh, I talk about the perennial philosophy here, and and this is a uh, this is really a big field in, uh, in 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 philosophy in general. But uh, to bring all of these together, I mean this. Uh, I think this is as a, a chance to really revolutionize the humanities as well as philosophy. And uh, okay, so uh, skipping ahead, go to the next chapter. This is uh, probably uh, one of the last few chapters. Uh, I talk about I, I talked about the phantom and fantasy dialogues earlier. Uh, one is fa a fantasy is just pure fiction, where the phantom is where one party is uh, absent. And so uh, I was able to devise a terminology in figures 9A and 9B for, for both of these. So this, this is a whole third level of, of uh, abstraction that complements the, uh, like the general unified themes. Well, these are, the fa these are the phantom variations, the prejudice, the proclamation, the edict. Testament. These, these are all literary devices for uh, addressing maybe, uh, especially the proclamation. You know, the king would put out the word, and people would go to the public square and read it. You know, and same with the follower rules, the grant, the charter, the sanction, the chronicle. And uh, I, I, I give some short passages in here why I, I, I'm convinced that these. These uh, literary devices are exactly where they should be here. So scanning down here to, we'll go to the fantasy dialogues, and this is a, 
you see all of these have a certain uh, amount of uh, fictional character. The myth, the fable, the legend, the parable, Christ spoke in parables, he, uh, roundabout way, allegory. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what I pulled together on this and uh, it really seems to work. Uh, I didn't try and put these into the schematic definition format because this is really abstract. And, uh, but believe it or not, if you study it hard enough, you can even put this in and it makes sense. You know, even the realm of fiction. So scr scrolling down, I, here we, uh, here I, I start talking about the Phantom Dialogue and then um, it's a monologue in words, okay? Soliloquy, monologue, letter writing, you know, core my internal dialogue. Because you're not here, you know? I, I just fill in your roles as if you were here, you know? And then, and then uh, the reader of the letter, they understand what, 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 was all, what the letter was all about and what, what I was thinking, okay? So it, it's just the if you, then I kind of thing. And I, I, I describe each of these, give them a paragraph or two, uh, the pledge, the proclamation, the uh, edict, the testament, and I'll uh, stop right there because uh, I didn't distinguish any transcendental uh, level on this because that's it just really, I, I, I couldn't really identify anything there. So it's just the first uh, personal group, spiritual and humanitarian. But uh, does that not say that somebody couldn't find the, the transcendental aspects on here? But let's go down to the follower roles here now. The grant. These are all action kind of things now. The charter. The sanction. That's a spiritual. Hey? These are uh, spiritual things. And then the chronicle. That's. Chronicle, you know that uh, brings the time in there. I mean, that's, that's a given the Viking sagas, the medieval quant. That's the only thing that kept civilization alive through the Dark Ages, these, these rare manuscripts that survived. And then so the fantasy, okay, we get down here to the fantasy dialogue. Fictional information, imagination, I mean. And, uh, here this... Uh, like I said, fiction is kind of rules the world here as far as as far as our entertainment industry and movies and and uh, literature it goes all the way back. So we've been telling stories as long as we've been walking on two legs. So uh, so here we got the fable, the personal, and then the legend is the group, and then the uh, parable has like spiritual overtones. Allegories, best I could find for humanitarian, and then uh, and then the follower roles. You got the rhetoric. That's uh, goes way back. Propaganda. That's a bad. It has bad overtones, but it just means that you know you you just winging it. You know, as far as uh, topics of a group nature. You know, I mean, and then uh, extending on down to the. Uh, the uh, prophecy, yeah, and then utopianism, yeah, and that's that's just pure imagination, fiction, whatever, because there never has been a utopian society, and uh, hopefully there will be one. You know, if we uh, getting the word out about this, people understand fully what's involved, and, and not. Um, be too concerned about their own selfish interests and, and look at the grand scale of things. Uh, I, I really have hope that uh, my, my progenitors or progeny, I mean, will uh, will survive and flourish. You know? So, uh, so um, here we got. Uh, here's an overview of all these of uh, these uh, two new categories. Phantom and Fantasy, and uh, I thought it was interesting that they both began with a hard F sound, you know. <laughs>
But uh, language is neat like that, you know. And uh, so uh, here I talk about maybe the potential for cross-cultural translations and uh, uh, English language is particularly rich, but uh, this might not work for some native cultures, but uh, I'm sure the uh, those with a long tradition would, would be able to be translated. So we're getting right now. Okay, here's, uh, this boils down to my uh, speculation I mentioned earlier about the uh, different eth ethical systems that are around. The golden rule is, is highly lauded, but it's, uh, it's pretty hard to follow all the time. <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, people do have self-interests, and, and uh, like I say, there's, uh, you, it's good to follow the golden rule. The, the, the contrast is uh, the iron rule, where, where only one's uh, interests are, are articulated. And if everybody did the iron rule, the, the society and culture would just fall apart. So you got your interloper, interlopers there that take advantage of the uh, golden rule people. And then scrolling down, we got a less stringent version of the golden rule, the silver rule, which is sometimes called ethical minimalism. And it, it says, uh, uh, you don't retaliate in any form to harm done by another, or, or you, you, you don't deliberately go out of your way to to uh, hurt anybody, even though you, you don't have to go out, you don't have to go as far as doing everybody good, like I said, this kind of ethical minimalism enables uh, more kind of a peace, peaceful kind of thing and, and kind of like the negative reinforcement. And then there's uh, also the uh, bronze rule. I, I read about this through Carl Sagan and uh, Repay Repay e kindness with kindness, but evil with justice. And this is essentially how the modern world works. Uh, like I said, uh, scrolling down a little bit here, the, uh, okay, yeah, here's a kind of a nice uh, schematic of all the different reigning world ethical strategies. And, uh, down here, uh, I discussed the like for like. That's kind of like the bronze rule is. If you step on my toes, you're, I'm not just going to turn that cheek. Uh, you're not, I'm going to have to respond in, in some kind of way. Although, in a just fashion, not. Uh, here, here we see, like I said, the United States scrupulously comp cooperates with its allies by responding in kind to attacks against its interests. And, and show how this can be modeled in, in terms of game theory and uh, computer programs, get round robin matchups, and the most successful program is tit for tat, <laughs> which is, uh, this program is nice, it's provocable, refers to the tune in cheek, and is also forgiving, permits a return to cooperation. Just like uh, we see in the everyday world here. So scrolling down here, we got different variations on the bronze rule, the social climber, the uh, tragedy of the commons, where cooperation is the must. Try to scrolling down, we got the, uh, we're gonna, I started summarizing here about the global scale harmony, and uh, I could read this word for word, but uh, like I say, it would, uh, I've kind of gone on a lot of this before about cooperation, how, how desperately it's needed in the world, and, and not the people that will take advantage through cr criminal means. Criminality is at, at the antithesis of cooperation. Fair goods and services at an equitable price. Services being the procurement and the, and the monetary being the reinforcement. 
So scrolling down there, um, I talk about yeah, just some some uh, detailed applications on uh, the schematic definitions and uh, how this maybe could influence the role. And then with any new system, you, you have to you have to name it. You know, I mean, so I settled on the new science of power play politics. That's a that's a, uh, a convergence of the power play and power politics. The power politics is like the authority part of it, and the power play is like the followers who, who group together and, and get an equal step standing with the personal authority. So I, I talk about the strike leverage and how you see the power play in hockey and. Uh, Football sometimes, soccer, and uh, I, I talk about a few general principles underlying power play politics. And uh, this is not set in stone, though. I, I, I maybe rename this down the road, but it's what I, I had. And then finally, these are the just a few pages of the master conclusions. This was some of this was in the abstract too. Uh, paraphrase where where, uh, where we could get religious cooperation uh, by realizing that we all use the same virtues and values and all based from the same behavioral uh, condition foundation and also uh, with this with the secular roles I mean uh, I've, I've noticed in, in the United States especially there there's just like a uh, just a um, prejudice against uh, the religious foundations, just because they uh, have a uh, scripture and everything, and are kind of exclusive, which is by nature what a religion is. But if we could show that uh, all the <coughs> if the like I said the secular government can can use these virtues and values and and make better citizens uh, through character education. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a shame what's, what's going on in uh, the public schools where, where these uh, students have a, uh, a gripe and they, they, they go in with a shotgun, you know. I mean, it's, it's, this happened the other day. It's, uh, so I, I think this has a really way to reach the uh, up and coming generation that are maybe confused, they haven't been exposed to this kind of stuff like uh, when I was uh, going through parochial school and everything and uh, I, I don't know if I was able to really pull this together without that kind of background. So let's uh, scroll down to the end here and see what the, I got uh, uh, talk about directed directions for further research. And uh, we talk about religious fanaticism. That's important because uh, religious fanatics, they overstep their bounds. You know, they, it should be universal, but they're, they're using it as a political tool and even a tool for subjugating people on a personal level. And, and that, that's a real abuse of, the, of, of universal authority. And so, and then like I said, the, if you can see the behavioral instincts that we have in common and everything, then we, like I said, we can serve as a value object for the major religions of the world. And, uh, and the ethical revival in the secular world, where there's no, no fear of uh, offending any, any group. I, I know people like to cling to what they've uh, brought, been brought up on. But, you can see it. You can see a way for real interreligious cooperation, at, with the secular realm also. So we're getting down to the end here. This uh, basically what I just said here: the uh, master overview of the abstract moral landscape. And uh, I did met, name this the motivational matrix. I've gone by other names in the past, but I, I find this 
this really uh, not 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 as a homage to uh, the Matrix movies, you know. But like I say, this could all be uh, incorporated uh, ethical safeguards and artificial intelligence. Maybe our computers are going to be the saints, and they're the ones that keep us in line. I hate to uh, say that, but. Uh, Anyway, that's that's uh, my, that's my presentation here, and uh, here's my bibliography. I can see that uh, wide range of, uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to thank certain of the uh, philosophers, William James, Immanuel Kant, and B.F. Skinner, and, and especially uh, my PhD supervisor, Professor Daryl Meister, for his support and discussions and encouragements. And, uh, and also the Dissertation Proposal Defense Committee and AUSN, American University of Sovereign Nations, for helping me to pursue my dream of a doctorate degree. I thank you for listening. This is John Lamouche signing off.